My name is Mandy Makiti. Today's date is February 24, 2018, and I'm interviewing Farid Abdul Hadi on the Ball State campus as part of the Virginia B Ball Center seminar, Muslims in Muncie. Farid, thank you for sharing your story with us today. My pleasure. So uh, I want to start by asking where and when were you born? Um, 1961, March 8th to be exact, in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell me uh, about your family, about growing up in Detroit in the 60s? Um, uh, I don't remember a, a, a whole lot about it. Um, you know, obviously I was really young. Um, grew up in a family that was a um, uh, church-going family. Um, my grandmother, um, in particular, my, my on, on both sides, my mother and father's side, um, uh, my grandmother, my, my mother's father was a was Methodist, I believe, and my uh, and my mother's mother and her father were Baptists, and we were closer to that side of the family. Obviously, it's, it seems to be a, a, a thing you're closer to the mom's side of the family, but um, grew up, you know, just like um, normal. Um, uh, we didn't we didn't have to go to church every Sunday or anything like that, but um, we did go to church quite frequently. Um, uh, as far as uh, Detroit goes, um, grew up in a um, uh, pretty um, I don't know a, a normal neighborhood as far as I knew at the time. Um, I do remember. Um, as far as from the sixties go, I remember, um, I semi vivid memories of the 67 riot, for instance, I was in the first grade at the time, um, got some, so a few, a few memories of that. Um, and it seemed to, seemed to whiz by pretty quick. I wasn't familiar with all the other, you know, the, um, the, um, the repercussions of, those riots, I just remember that we had to, that particular summer was um, <laughs> particularly rough on us because we had to be in the house quite a bit, you know, and didn't understand why, but we were told, um, you know, my mother told me there's a riot, you know, going on. Who knew what that was? All I knew is what I heard on the news. And I just remember hearing, um, I started to get an idea of what a riot was from watching the news pretty quick when I heard about a um a um a fireman being shot um i remember it it's, it was it sounded so crazy to me because they said the fireman was shot between uh shot in the eye while you know fighting the fire um that was pretty um uh, just pretty wild at that time but um yeah and i uh, you know some some semi vivid memories of that but Anything else that really stood out in the sixties? I was a little kid, um, so um, and, I, and I believe I told you also a story about um, before about how um, that that previous Christmas, obviously, we had gotten these um, uh, toy guns for for Christmas, um, and um, you know, machine guns with a tripod, the whole thing, you know, a boy thing. You know, we like play army things like that. And um, we lived on, on a rather busy, rather busy street. And um, we, I just remember, we used to get excited when we saw the, um, the National Guard coming down the street. And we used to, you know, we just used to refer to them, refer to them as the Army Men. And so, we saw them this particular day and oh here come the army man you know they're coming down in their in their truck or whatever and uh we wanted to play with them so we went and got our guns and the you know we we're on the porch and the porch has these slats for banisters and whatnot and um we set them up on the tripod laying down on the on the ground and we're gonna play with the army man we're gonna play like we're shooting at them and <laughs> praise God, man, my mother came out and she just went ballistic, you know, I, I guess at the thought of what could happen. And then in retrospect, I think about it, I'm like, yeah, that could have been pretty, you know, could have been pretty crazy. 
Um, but she came out there just ballistic and, you know, um, alhamdulillah, nothing happened. But it was, um, I, you know, I'm thinking, of course, as a kid, what's the big deal? You know, <laughs> what the army men don't want to play, you know. But um, yeah, that, that that was a pretty that's a pretty uh, vivid memory that stands out for me during that time during the riots. But other than that, um, as far as the '60s go, memories are you know just just a kid growing up, you know, playing, um, um, you know, doing what kids do fighting, going to school, um, playing sports, things like that, you know. Uh, can you tell me uh, about your parents, their names, occupations? Yeah, um, my father, who passed away in um, about 1975, I believe, um, pretty young man. He passed away at the age of 43 or 44. His name is it was Julius Williams. And um, he was from, his family is from um, Mississippi. Um, I think it's Robbinsville, Mississippi, something like that. Um, my mother, her family was from Florida. And to give you an idea, of, um, and, and her name is Walter May Williams. And don't laugh because we got, we got teased about that all the time when we were growing up. That was kind of how we played. Um, and... Um, Growing up, people knew each other's mother's names, and that's how we would tease each other. It was pretty rough, though. I mean, it was it was some serious stuff. Some fights would come out of it. But anyway, her name was Walter May, and the name it, it turns out the name is very unique. I'm proud of it now because she. Um, but I was, you know, I was ashamed. I was like, it sounds funny. No one ever say her name, right? But um, um, she was named after my grandfather. She was the first first of their children. So obviously, you know, when I think about this, he wanted a son. You know, he wanted a son named after him. When when it when it turned out to be a girl, he threw May on the end of it, and that was her name. A lot of people from the South do that. African American people, anyway. We have a Johnny May in the family. We have a Willa May in the fa or Willie May in the family. Um, it's just one of those things that they do. Take a man's name and put May at the end of it. For that being said, her family is from Florida. And um, yeah, they they got um, her last her, her maiden name is Beatty, if that's of any relevance. Um, they got married in uh, I you know what I think it was probably about 1958 or something like that. Probably um, the same year that my um, that my oldest brother was born. So yeah, um, as far as occupation goes, uh, my mother when I was um, when I was younger, as a you know, in the, in the I'd say in the '60s, maybe um, to the early '70s, she didn't work much outside the home. Um, I mean, there were six of us, so she had plenty to do at home. And I hope that doesn't sound um, too chauvinistic, but I mean, that's we're talking about the '60s, right? So um, she had uh, she didn't work a lot at that time. She did eventually start working. As a um, and she 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 started as a right when the hot lunch program started in Detroit actually, and um, she started working at the school, um, not coincidentally at the same school we went to, and um, she was she was um, as I said she was one of the lunch ladies, and she. As the, as time went on, she actually worked herself up pretty pretty high in the in the um, in the um, the uh, food service um, industry for the board of education. But um, as I said, when I was a small child, she didn't do much. But then she eventually started working in that capacity. My father, my father was, um, you know, my father did a, a he was primarily um, a factory worker. But my father was kind of, um, my father had a troubled kind of life, you know. Um, I remember, <laughs> I remember um, that, and this is one of those memories from the '60s, and this is way back when I and and my mother used to tell us that um, that my father was in the army. Now he had been in the army. He went. He went to. Um, he was in in Korea, and but that was in the earlier early '50s or the early to mid fifties. And, um, but she used to tell us that he was in the army. And 
we would go see him, right? So if you can <laughs> grasp the irony of that, right? We used to go see him in the Army. And it wasn't until years and years later that I thought after I had been in the military, even after I had been in the military and friends I knew had been in the military, that I started thinking, wait a minute now, if, if Daddy was in the Army, why were we going to see him? Who goes to see somebody in the Army? And what was that? And, and, and my memories, you know, were of a thick screen in front of him, right? So as an adult, I put two and two together and found out he was in the penitentiary. And, um, um, you know, and, and, and I don't think it was for a very long time. I think he, you know, um, uh, he may have gone again, at you know, for a couple of years. But he, he kind of had a, a, you know, a um, kind of rough, you know, um, I mean, you know, for whatever reason, you know, he had some challenges that he dealt with. But eventually, when I, when I, I think as a teenager, he kind of settled in, you know, and um, he did work. He, I, re, I recall that he went to, um, he was going to an electronics school and trained in electronics. And, um, you know, he was, he, he was, from those years on, he was always around. I mean, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like he was, um, uh, I don't know what kind of work he was doing. I figured it had to be the electronics, but he was working and he, um, and he was around. So, you know, um, I, I think he settled in a little, you know, a little later and, and, and when he really, my mother, my mother often talked about after he passed away, she did, um, I do remember her saying that she was, um, that she was actually angry at him because, you know, for, for dying when he did, you know, I mean, in that kind of way, not, not like in an unreasonable kind of, you know what I mean? Just kind of heart to heart. Yeah, I was angry at him for, for dying at the time that he did because, um, you know, things have just started to go well, you know, that kind of thing. So. Uh, even though uh, you mentioned that going to church on Sundays wasn't that important, did you have any uh, religious education like Sunday school? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew about, um, I mean, it was, you know, when I say it, it it's, when I say that, um, and, and, Actually, I don't think I said that it wasn't important. What I said is that we, um, and that you know, nothing against you, but that, but what I was, what I was saying is that we didn't have, we didn't go to church like every Sunday, right? So, but it was, you know, it was important. I mean, that's where I learned about, I learned about um, God in my home, right? And you know, and in church, you know, my mother, my mother would tell me about him. My, um, my father wasn't a. Um, I don't think my father was a particularly religious man, you know, but he did know some things and he would, you know, he would talk to us about them, you know. Um, I think he believed in God, um, but he didn't, he didn't, my father did not go to church. But we did, um, to answer your question, yeah, we, we went to, um, to, if I can, you know, uh, go back a little bit when I talked about his mother, where we lived, we lived in a um, in a row house where his mother lived right next door to us. Okay, and the church was right across the street. So during the time that we, from the time that we moved into that neighborhood, um, we were we were sent over to church quite often. We were sent over across the street, go to church, you know, and we would at least go to Sunday school. So yeah, I did. Uh, I learned quite a bit. I mean, that's where. Um, that's the foundation of anything that I knew about Christianity is I, it, you know, I learned in, in my early years in church. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, your schooling, about going to school in Detroit, mm -hmm. primary school, middle school? Yeah. Um, uh, man, um, you know, just, just, uh, just a normal, in my mind, just just normal. I mean, I went to school, you know, went to elementary, middle, and high school. Um, um, nothing, you know. I didn't play any sports or anything like that. I was um, just a, you know, kind of actually kind of 
introverted in a way, especially, you know, um, you know, during my teenage years, whatever, I was kind of, I think I was more of an an extrovert when I was younger, when I, you know, when there was a, a, when when life was all about playing and having fun, you know, um, playing sports and things like that. I mean, I love sports, but I never played, um, not organized at school or anything like that. But um, but then when I got to high school, you know, it got really awkward for me, and um, and I did some, you know, I was I was. I got on the wrong track, you know, um, used to, you know, just, and I think it was all about trying to get, you know, trying to get attention, trying to be, trying to be, uh, trying to feel, uh, relevant or trying to get some attention basically. Um, and I started, you know, kind of hanging out with the, with the wrong guys and stuff like that. And, um, so Although I had fun in school and things like that, I didn't. I didn't really get after my first two years of high school. I didn't really get much out of it because I wouldn't go, you know. And if I did go, it was just to, um, you know, just to hang out basically. And I wasn't. I wasn't really getting anything out of it because I was, you know, trying to, trying to. Um, uh, I mean, and this was back in the seventies, and we had, you know, we had gangs and stuff like that, and that's what I wanted to be. I just wanted to be. You know, I wanted to be tough. I wanted to be hard, but I, man, I was so soft. I mean, whenever, whenever, whenever it would come time to do something, <laughs> really, and and I often say this because uh, whenever it came time to do something, um, you know, I'm right there. We about to do something really, you know, on the edge or whatever. I always found a way to kind of be there and not be there. You know what I mean? Like, um, um. I, I give you an example. There was one time when they were um, when um, we were at the school, me and my uh, three of my friends, and um, and for whatever reason, you know, um, I think we ended up. We saw this kid, and I think we ended up taking some money from him and and beating him up. Right? There were three of us. Um, no, four of us that jumped on this kid. And wallahi, by by God, I never put a hand on him. I never laid a hand on him, but I was right there, and I I stood there, and I and I made it look good or whatever. But I never I never laid a hand on the kid. Didn't do anything. Didn't kick him. Didn't didn't slap nothing. And um, but I mean, and that's how it was. I remember um, also uh, uh, a um, incident where. Um, where some of the guys broke into a house and I was there and I wanted to, you know, um, I'm seeing these guys go in and I'm like, I am not going in there. I'm not going in. So I, I got out of that one by saying, I'll be the lookout. You know, I remember my father telling us a story about him and another guy going into a, uh, breaking into a house and they fought over who was going to go in first. And they got, this guy went in first and, there's a guy waiting for him on the other side of the door. Blew him away, and um, never forgot that story. But, but I, I say all that to say when I when I go back and think about it, and I and I think about the guys that I hung out with and the neighborhood I came up in, and and the things that were going on, and and believe I know a lot of a, a lot of guys that I grew up with um, ended up in some into some bad stuff, right? Um, did hard time, you know, hard prison time and whatnot. And um, somewhere in my life, I thought about this, and I said, "Okay, so what? What was it that that made me, you know, that made us never cross that line?" And I was convinced that it was just that foundation that my mother had laid for us, and that you know, just um, um, something because my mother cared. Now, a, a lot of guys that I, I came up with, when it was um, most of the stuff that was being done would be done late at night, of course, right? So when they're um, um, so when they're out doing, getting into the stuff that I thought I wanted to get into, I had to be in the house and, you know, my mom and dad didn't play about that. So I had to be in, I thought it was pretty cool to be out until 11 o'clock at night, but you know, that was fine with me and 12 on the weekends, but they would get into whatever dirt they were doing at one, two in the morning. Um, and it always seems, and I'm not going to say that people's parents didn't care. 
because I knew some other some of my other friends they did have parents that were strict, but they didn't just didn't seem as strict as mine was, and and uh, as or as my parents were. And I think that that was I think that the fact that they no matter what we did, my mother never. Um, you know, and I won't say gave up, but she she always stayed on us about it, about whatever it was. She stayed on top of us, and um, and I think that was what made me not cross that line ultimately. Where because a lot of those guys crossed the line and they couldn't come back, right? They they did something that was so bad and ended up, you know, either uh, you know being killed, hurt, uh, or did a lot, you know, serious time that they, you know, one of those things that it's, it's really, really difficult to rebound from, right? So I think that that foundation is what kept me from from crossing that line. But I digress. you asked me about school, yeah. and I, here I am talking about all this. <laughs> but, okay. um, yeah, but I mean, I and, and I, um, I, I, I dropped out of school at um, – at the uh, earliest opportunity, which um, you could legally drop out of school at the age of 16 at that time. I don't know if it's, um, I, I don't know about such things now, but um, when I turned 16, I, um, hey, I can legally stop going and and um, and I don't have to explain to the police anymore why I'm not in school and, you know, and stuff like that. So I dropped out. I was just pretty much done with school or so I thought anyway. So, yeah, my... Um, uh, you know, uh, high school was, I mean, it was kind of, it was kind of tough, you know, um, you know, a lot of things going on at, at school and whatnot, like I said, gangs and things like that, things that I thought I wanted to be in, but really in my heart, I was just really, you know, I, I, I didn't really have the heart for it, but I, you know, just being a stubborn kid, I just, you know, I, I thought one day I'm, I'm going to get tough one day, one day I'm, I'm going to be able to do this stuff, you know, but you know, I'm I just never, you know, um, uh, never got that bad. But I did drop out of school at 16, and you know, did some night school classes at one time. But um, um, yeah, as a matter of fact, you know what? <clears throat> what actually happened, what made me drop out, was that I would, like I said, I would go to the school and hang out. Or whatever. So I was still going, but I wouldn't be going to class. I would just be going and go to classes that I wanted to go to, you know. And um, and I had already gotten. There were three schools in our in our region, three high schools in our region, and I had already gotten um, kicked out of one of them. And and um, and I went and hung out in this classroom one morning and. You know, instead of going to class, we sitting there, you know, getting high or whatever. We used to sneak our bottles of beer up there early in the morning, man. It would be like seven in the morning. We got beer. We were some bad kids, man. And um, and we got a little rambunctious in the room and got caught, and I got kicked out. I couldn't. I, I did not want to go home and face my mother. And then at that time, right at that time is when I said, I got to do something, and I got to do it now because I think I was um, – uh, I was, as a matter of fact, I was 17. So let me retract what I was saying. I was going to school up until the point when I was 17, but I was just going, right? I wasn't really doing anything. I was, for all intents and purposes, I was a dropout. During that so, time, did you continue to attend church? Um, periodically, but no, not. Um, there was a time... Um, uh, even before that, when I was like in middle school or something, as we became teenagers, that it was only, I remember it would, it would only be my sisters going to church and I'd stay at home and watch football. You know, Sunday was the day to be home and watch football or whatever. And my mother wasn't pushing it, you know, pushing us that hard to go to church. Um, the church that we actually were members of was in another neighborhood. It, it was my grandmother's church. So, um, Do you remember the name of that church? Illiton Baptist. Illiton Baptist Church, and um, I remember my sisters would go a lot. We would go, you know, as a, um, and I, I don't want to lump Christians or anything like into into you know any kind of category or whatever. But in my in my neighborhood, right, people would go to church or in Detroit. Period. I mean, it was just a thing. We go to church on Easter because we got new clothes, right? So. 
You get new clothes, something nice to wear, need something to do, go to church. So we go to church on Easter. That was one day you could always count on us being in, in church because if not, we wasn't going to get to wear this new stuff, right? So we were, so we would go on Easter um, and just just periodically. I don't know what whatever you know would motivate me to go to church at that time. So I didn't go too often. Maybe you know I went to a church with my with with. Um, I used to go to church often with my buddy on the other side of town. Why? Because there were a lot of girls at his church. And they and um, we used to, you know, I had a girlfriend over there, right? Or thought I had a girlfriend. Lived way on the other side of town. I couldn't even get to her if I wanted to. But um, yeah, we would go for that reason. We would even go to. We would go to. Um, they would have revival during the week, and we were there at revival every night. Every night that my my buddy's mom went to revival, we were there for the girls, though, <laughs> right? So getting nothing out of church, but still, you know. I, you know, I knew what Christianity was. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you joined uh, the military. Mm -hmm. So uh, when was this? Was this after you joined the house? Yeah, this was, um, like I said, after that incident in the uh, school where I was definitely going to, you know, I got kicked out. And um, I just remember going home just thinking, because it it, it was, um, I think that was really my, my um, kind of my awakening um, to more or less say, okay, y your next, your next move is adulthood, right? And what do you have, right? What do you, what do you, what are you going to do with your life, right? Um, I was 17, I'm kicked out of school and I just, I just, I don't know, something just, it just at that time I said to myself, whatever, however I came to this conclusion, whatever it was, I said I got to do something and I got to do it now, right? And the only thing I could think of because some of the other guys that I knew who were um, who decided they wanted to do something, everybody would join the military. So I'm like, hey, crap, man, I'm going to the military. I'm going in, right? And um, and so I started pursuing that. And um, I had a buddy who went to the, um, three of us went to the military at the same time. One of my buddies went to the Marines and I wanted to go to the Marines. The Marines wouldn't take me because they told me to get my school records. And according to my school records, I hadn't even passed the 10th grade. I was still in the 10th grade. You know, when you take my credits and, you know, put them... I'm still in the 10th grade, so they're like, nope, we don't want you. So, I mean, I was, um, and it depressed me because I really, really wanted to go, right? And I and I was thinking, I mean, because at this point, I'm like, really, I'm thinking I'm about to get my life started. I'm going away. I'm going to, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm joining the military. I'm going to go away. I'm going to make some money. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to see the world, you know, whatever illusions I had of what I was going to do. I mean, I, I could see them coming together. Yeah, I'm going to do this, right? And then they told me they weren't going to take me, and I was kind of deflated and like, man, what am I going to do? And, um, you know, just one day, maybe I wasn't even thinking about it, an Air Force recruiter called me and told me, uh, said, yeah, I understand you were trying to get into the Marines, and they wouldn't take you. And I said, hey, yeah. He said, um, um, excuse me. He said, um, "Well, if you go and get your, if you go and get your GED, we'll take you in the Air Force." So I said, "Okay, cool." So I went to GED school for about, um, and I told my mother. Now my mother's already telling me because I'm 17. Um, I'm not signing anything. No, that's not what you're gonna do. And um, um, you know, we went back and forth with that. But I would go to this GED school for about a week, do some, you know, study the material and whatnot. Uh, went and took this GED test, and um, for what it's worth, had the highest score of the day, right? So, um, man, my mother was so mad at me because she said, because she was, um, and, and I get it, because she said what, she talked about how, look what you can do when you apply yourself, right? You can do anything you want to do if you apply yourself. 
here you've been BSing through school all this time. You could have been, you know, and, and look what you can do when you try. And, um, yeah, I get that. And great, Mom, but I'm going to the Air Force now, right? And um, she said that she told me that she wouldn't, uh, that she wasn't going to uh, sign for me to go. Now I'm coming up on my 18th birthday now. It's, uh, it's like February. And um, um, I just told her, you know, Mom, look, um, if you don't sign them now, Next month I'm 18. I don't need your permission to go in. So why not let me get started now, or whatever? And she relented and signed, and so I went to the military. Uh, what year did you join? That was 1979. And how long did you serve? I stayed in for <laughs> unbelievably 12 years. I stayed in. Can you tell me about your experiences there? Oh, yeah. Um, man, it was, um, military was great for me because, I mean, it just started out as what, you know, really what I wanted was just a job and the in, in the in, in the skills to do something, right? To to, um, to make something out of my life, right? Um, I went to the military and I forgot everything I knew about, you know, um, that gang life and and the things that I was, you know, doing when I was in Detroit. I mean, some of the things I still did, obviously. Military is a um, you know, whether people know it or back then anyway, it was a it was a get high, get drunk culture, right? It was a it was just a it was almost I would I wouldn't I would probably equate it to, you know, maybe being in, in college, right? Um, except you had a job, <laughs> a full time job and um uh, I mean, I had a lot of fun. Um, I I saw some places that I never would have seen if I hadn't, you know, gone to the military. For instance, I started out and I, uh, when I first went in. I went to um, I went to Oklahoma City, and it, because there was a base there. Now, why did I pick Oklahoma? The only thing I can tell you is I had no idea where I wanted to go. Of all the places that I could have gone to or could have aspired to go to, I picked Oklahoma because a buddy of mine was in the Army and he was in Oklahoma. Now, I don't, you know, that's that's some, that's kind of some, uh, <laughs> having some low standards, but I went to Oklahoma. I went to Oklahoma City and it was, it was good though. I mean, it was a good experience that, you know, to be on my own and, and, um, um, you know, really just start living. Um, got, you know, discipline. Um, I mean, obviously you get that in the military. And uh, um, and I, I still tell, um, you know, I told my kids as they were growing up and I tell, you know, um, you know, my grandkids now, I tell, you know, I, uh, I was in the military for 12 years and I missed, maybe two days of work because, you know, for being sick or whatever. When, you know, I'm, I look at people that, that take off work because they, cause they got a cold or whatever. And, um, you had to actually run a temperature <laughs> to, uh, to, um, be authorized to take a day off in the military. But anyway, I got a, um, you know, I got discipline. Um, after being in, in Oklahoma city for a year, I decided I started talking to people who had been the, to these different countries, and and um, you know, I, I run into people who've been in one place, and they tell me about it, and 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 I get hung up. It seems like I get hung up on one place. So I meet this one guy in particular that I uh, got close to. He had been in Spain, so I got to go to Spain. I just got to go, right? And so, um, as it turned out, um, I had been, like I said, I had been in Oklahoma a year, and I get this assignment to Spain. And um, um, I'm thinking before I went there, man, I mean, just, you know, it's just scary, right? Going to a, um, in my mind, going to a foreign country. Because, I, you know, to me, you know, in my mind, every place is, every place is mean except America, right? I, I don't know what to expect. So I go to, so we go to, I go to Spain and uh, end up being there four years and loved it. I mean, just doing things that I never would have been able to do. Never would have been able to do here. Um, so I was over there four years. I got um, uh, saw that whole country, 
you know, traveling, uh, vacationing, things like that. Um, I got married over there, you know, the first time I got married, um, which was in 1983, I believe. And I, I went over there for two years. I went over there in, in 81 for, um, for what was supposed to be, what, what was supposed to be a two year tour. And then I got married and I extended to stay over there two more years. And, um, and I remember guy, you know, so it, it's, you know, Americans are funny this way. We go over to, to another country and, um, that, you know, that term ugly American, right. They, you know, guys I knew were, they were, they were depressed over there, right. I'm having the time of my life and people are depressed because they can't speak the language and, and they don't have TV over here. You know, we can't get TV over here. And because you can't get the things that, that you get in the U S over there, a lot of people didn't want to be there, right? But I'm having a ball. I'm learning the language, you know. I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm meeting people. Um, you know, got cool with a bunch of Spanish families. Just, you know, and I'm living out on the economy. I don't live on the base or anything like that. You know, they they love me and my family. By this time, when my um the, my uh, my wife had a six year old son when we got married, and then um and then. Uh, we had my first son, you know, um, they loved our family, man. It was, it, it, and it was just real, real cool, you know. So I did four years over there. Um, left there and uh, trying to stay, you know, trying to keep my family together so that we could, because my wife was in the Air Force as well. And um, sometimes when you're in the military, in order to get a, uh, an assignment where you can stay together, you got to kind of take the bottom of the barrel, whatever. They can send you anywhere because they like you. You just happy to stay, to be together, right? Which is true, you know. And so I ended up coming to, uh, going to North Dakota, and I spent a year there. And the whole time, the whole year that I spent there, I spent trying to figure out how am I going to get out of here. And um, uh, I don't know if you ever been to North Dakota. It's cold. It's flat. It's it's just really boring. And um, um, I ended up, my wife got out of the Air Force, and I ended up um, taking a remote assignment just to get out of there. Excuse me. I took a remote assignment to Turkey and, um, you know, with a with a follow-up assignment to, so if I take this remote, they give me a follow-up and say, okay, you go do this year, um, this 15 months in Turkey, and when you come back, where do you want to go? Okay, cool. I'll do that. I'll do anything to get out of North Dakota. I'll do the I'll do the, the remote assignment, and when I come back, I want to go to Florida. You know, so I did that. I go to Turkey again, thinking, "Oh man, this is crazy." I don't know if you ever seen you ever seen Midnight Express. You know that movie? Anybody know Mid Midnight Express? Oh man, watch Midnight Express if you ever get a chance. Oh, but anyway, I'm thinking Midnight Express. I bet the professor knows Midnight Express. But um, but I get over there and I have a ball. I mean, it's just it's nothing like, you know, I I thought it would have been. Um, you know, of course, if you go and in, get into what the what the dude got into in Midnight Express, yeah, it's not gonna be so so nice. He tried to bring back um, just to be a spoiler, he tried to bring back um uh, a bunch of hash, bunch of hashish on his person from Turkey. Right. And got caught by customs and he ended up spending um, years and years and years in the Turkish prison. So anyway, I had a ball over there. It was it was like, man, it was like being in freaking New York or something. You know, Istanbul is just, you know, cosmopolitan, nothing like you would think. I mean, but is but it also had that, you know, that um, that, uh, you know, I. I not to sound corny, but that old world charm, right? They got some, some, uh, you know, it, it's a it's a big city with, you know, big apartment buildings and things like that. But at the same time, it's in the midst of a of a you know, ancient buildings and you know, old culture. And it's a Muslim country. Um, and as a matter of fact, first time I ever heard the Athan come over the, um, come over a, a, a speaker was there. And it scared the mess out of me. I was in a hotel room 
when I first got there. And uh, the first thing I heard was, Allah, whack, blah. And, oh, man, what's going on? And, and um, I had no idea what it was, but it, it scared me. But the, it, it wasn't a um, wasn't a Muslim country like um, Saudi Arabia or some of the other Muslim countries that we might know about. I don't know, maybe even where you're from. Um, it was like a democratic country where Islam was the predominant religion, but the government wasn't, um, wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a religious government, whether there was no Sharia law or anything like that. So. Uh, did, you re did you return to Detroit right after your service? Uh, yes, I did. Uh -huh. As it turns out, um, I didn't plan to, but that's, that's what ended up happening. Mm-hmm. Did you have any exposure to the Nation of Islam while you were in Detroit? Um, no, I, well, some, very, very limited. Um, I worked with, um, worked with the Nation of Islam on, uh, for a, a mayor, mayor uh, for an election for mayor. I cannot say that mayor, mayoral, mayoral, a mayoral <laughs> election. Uh, I worked with them then, passing out flyers and and trying and getting people to come out and vote and things like that. Um, I used to see those guys. I mean, um, even coming up in the in the seventies and you know sixties, we would see um, uh, Nation of Islam downtown. They had you know um, they had restaurants and you know and they would be uh, they were you would always see them on Saturday. Um, on Saturday morning, out um, uh, selling, you know, food, bean pies. Um, uh, they would they sell fruit. They had the best fruit, man. They sell incense, um, uh, oils, and um, and then of course they had their newspaper. You know, the Final Call or Muhammad Speaks at the time when I was coming up in my younger days, Muhammad Speaks. Um, yeah, but that was, that was not very much exposure to him. Um, I think my father might have had some exposure. Um, and I, I only say that because, uh, I remember, I remember a friend of his coming over saying to us, and we thought it was kind of a, 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 like a rhyme thing. He, I mean, he would come over and he would say, Assalamu alaikum. And, um, and then he would say, you're supposed to say, Alaikum assalam. And so he would say, Assalamu alaikum. We say, Alaikum assalam. <laughs> and it was, you know, but once he got us to say it, it was, you know, we did that little back and forth. And I just remember my dad having some, uh, I remember seeing something on a table one time. I was a real young kid and it was, it was in what I know now is Arab was written in Arabic. And, and I'm looking at it, and I was saying, "What is this?" And and my mother, I remember my mother getting upset and saying, "Put that down, leave that alone. You don't, you know, you don't need to see that or whatever." As if I was going to be able to read it. I don't know. Maybe she thought it had some kind of mystical, you know, kind of power to it or something. If I read it, and suddenly I'm going to be reading Arabic, reciting Quran or whatever. But um, um, yeah, so he may have had some exposure because I do remember those guys, um, you know. His friend, salam alaikum alaikum salam. But then it turns out, man, everybody you can go to the African American community and everybody knows a salam alaikum alaikum salam. But um, yeah, as far as not not much exposure to the to the nation of Islam, I I um, I, uh, I understood who they were. I remember um, um, back in the seventies. Before I went to the military, a long time ago, we used to watch, um, you know, Soul Train. And I don't know if you guys ever heard of Cool in the Gang. Uh, you know, a group from, they, they started back in the 70s. And what I remembered about them is they were on Soul Train one day and they were, they had just come out. They were a new group. And um, we loved their music, right? And they were on Soul Train and... You know, you're expecting, 
you know, the, the, the you know, this is the '70s. So you're expecting um, afros, bell bottoms, you know, shiny suits or whatever, because this is what you're used to seeing, right, from music from music groups. And these guys are on the stage, and they got on. They're wearing these. They're wearing black suits, you know, little thin ties, very neat. They got their hair cut, you know. Now, come on, you know, black people don't didn't cut their hair back then, right? And they got they've got close haircuts, um, you know, a little part on the side, just just look like something I'd never seen before, right? Didn't and I'm and I'm looking at them and I'm saying, what's? And my mother was there, and I said, what is? Why they dress like that? But I'm thinking they look kind of cool. But I'm saying, why they, why, how they, why they dress like that? And I remember my mother saying, "Oh, them some of them Muslims, you know." And uh, Muslims, what's that? You know, I, I had no idea what a Muslim was, and um, she kind of explained it a little bit. But um, I understood that it was a religion. But um, yeah, those, they were Nation of Islam, and that was their. That was there and still is to an extent. They wear bow ties now, but that that is their method of dress. That's the way they distinguish themselves. They wear the suits. They wear, you know, the short haircuts. They're really, really, really neat. I'm sure you guys have seen them. You know, um, yeah. So that you know that just but but any any kind of face to face exposure with them, not much except for the guys that we would see out. You know, selling the fruit and things like that, and um, and in the restaurants and that sort of thing. Uh, were you familiar with uh, some of the famous, the significant figures of the nation of Islam, mm-hmm. such yep. as Elijah Muhammad, Bruce mm-hmm. Malcolm X? Yeah, not not too familiar with um, with elijah muhammad but the but my understanding about the nation of islam when i became when i first became interested in knowing was when i read the uh, autobiography of malcolm x and um and um you know of course muhammad ali i you know i knew he was nation of islam i i thought kareem abdul jabbar was but I, you know, I didn't know. I, I mean, as far as I knew, that was the only Islam that there was, right? Until I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and um, and then I got a, a a a really really good understanding of what the Nation of Islam was. Where did you read the autobiography? Um, when I was in Spain during those um, first years when I wasn't married, and I was. Uh, yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, it was in in my dorm room. Yep. How did you get a hold of a copy? Oh, um, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, it wasn't. It, it's not like it was. It would have been difficult to find. I think um, maybe my roommate had it. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure where I got it from. But I, um, um, I remember it was. It was. Uh, it was written. Or what do you call it when a who, who, who does the autobi you know somebody does an autobiography, and an and an actual author writes it. So Alex Haley wrote it, and um, I was familiar with him from Roots, of course, and um, and so I read it, and it was a it was a very 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 interesting read. I couldn't put it down, you know, and um, yeah, read it, enjoyed it. Um, that was that was my first that had to really be my first exposure to Islam was through that book or any kind of understanding of it of Islam and this was before you went to Turkey correct? yeah mm-hmm. but what really the the thing that really stood out to me about it when all was said and done is um is you know how it ended basically how it ended now of course the you know the 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 book um you know at the time that it was finished of course you know Malcolm X was you know you're still alive but um but what really what really got my attention was the fact that 
when all was said and done, he said that he went to that 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 he found out what true Islam was, and that it wasn't, um, you know, wasn't what Elijah Muhammad was teaching, and wasn't what they understand it, uh, what they understood it to be. And I, and, I, I, and I say that's interesting because it it then made me want to know what real Islam was, but at the same time, um, there was a there was a um, there was a time, and I mean, and even now, especially, but but there was a time in the eighties when, when um, it was probably around the time Spike Lee did his movie, and um, there was a a, a uh, there was a big Malcolm X love fest, right? You know, among African American people, they were like, you know, Malcolm X, and they, and but what they, but what they embraced was his, um, was that radical side that he that he um had when he was with the nation of islam and you you would still hear people talk about um how um you know their their philosophy was that you know white man is the devil um um and that you know um we are the lost tribe of shabazz here in america you know, in the in in the wilderness, uh, trying to find our way back home, or um, uh, and all that part of it. And people seem to the the um, when they were embracing Malcolm X in the eighties, that's what they were focused on, right? That's what they would always talk about. But it was it was strange to me because. You know, I knew that at the end of his, he said, this was not Islam. So why is this? And I guess it was just something they felt like they could relate to, I guess, you know, um, you know, from a, a, a unity standpoint. I mean, dealing with whatever, dealing with the, the um, with, you know, what we were dealing with as blacks in America. You know, so, of course, and, and they, they, they actually say, talking to brothers like... Um, um uh brother um Abdul Rahman and um and Rashid they say that that um that the reason that um that the nation of Islam presented Islam is the way the, the, the way that they did is because they did because of how because of the way that that um, black people in America had been so indoctrinated with Christianity. The only way to 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 break them away from Christianity was and 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 get them to thinking you know more independently was to make Islam something that they could identify with, something that was so. Therefore, they said this is a religion for the black man. Right. And so that that made the um, that that in their minds. And I guess it did, you know, it did do that. I mean, it did it for me um, when I didn't understand it. Right. Um, it may it was something that they could identify with. And so they they and so it made it easier for black people to, to go over to that. Oh, this is our religion. This is really we're God's chosen people, you know, kind of. That kind of thing. I mean, because that's in essence what they were saying. And um, um, man, I forgot what I was talking about. But yeah, but what I was saying is that it was it 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 kind of uh, it was funny to me that nobody ever talked about the fact that Malcolm X said he went to he went he went uh, to the Hajj and he found true Islam. So you know, in my mind, shouldn't we be trying to find out what? true Islam is, right? Um, we know it's not that. So, you know, and it's serious business because it's about, you know, it's about God. It's about your salvation, right? So we should want to know what's right. So, yeah, I forgot your question, but I hope I answered it. <laughs> okay. Did you uh, ever consider becoming part of the nation of Islam? I did, but but the strangest thing the strange thing about it was I always knew that it wasn't Islam, but 
it would, um, and it, and it seems crazy to me now when I think about it because it would. I wanted to when I when I, when I got to the point where I wanted to be a Muslim. I wanted to understand. I, I, I just wanted to worship. I wanted to be a Muslim, and so I was having. I, I, I couldn't. There was no community. I didn't know where the community was, and um, and. I wanted to learn. And so my mind would sometimes go back to, well, maybe I should go to the, you know, maybe I should go to the Nation of Islam and talk to them and and start, you know, start working with them and you know what I mean? And start worshiping with them and whatnot. And um I even had a friend here, you know, since I after I came to Indiana that that actually told me and I and I told him because in my heart, you know, from um from you know a time back like maybe in 1991 or something like that in my heart I was a Muslim right because I I got to the point where it was where I felt like where I knew in my heart okay there's only one God and you know and if there is a if my thought was always if there is a a true religion then this is it right but a friend of mine said uh, we saw some guys from the Nation of Islam, and he said, "That's who you're supposed to be with, right?" Because he knew was, he knew I was a Muslim. He was a um, he's a Muslim as well, or he, you know, and it, this is a theological kind of thing where you know you'll understand. But he's um, he, he's with a group called the Moore Science Temple, which is actually, as I found out later, it, it's a um, it is actually where the Nation of Islam originated okay so elijah Poole actually learned from elijah Poole, elijah muhammad actually learned from this brother noble drew ali they call him prophet drew ali he learned what he learned from him and spun it into the nation of islam but it it all came from the moorish science temple and this is what this brother, this is this is um, the Islam that this brother follows. And so he told me, because I didn't, I said, well, you know, you know, we know that uh, well, our theological understanding is that there was one last prophet. And so therefore nobody can come and say I'm a prophet. So anyway, um, and that's where I told him that's where, nope, that's why I can't get behind that. But he said, you should be with them. And, um, you know, of course, I said, no, nah, no, nope, I shouldn't be with them because um, the thing that always kept me off, the, that that always reminded me that I had, that I didn't belong with the Nation of Islam is because I really wanted to be a Muslim. I really wanted to be to understand and practice my religion. And, um, and there's a statement in their newspaper in in you know uh, in the uh, final call newspaper that they have, and I would go and get it because the the Nation of Islam they they do some good things, and you know we're we're you know we as Muslims we are with anybody who who uh, who fights for justice, right? Who fights for the oppressed? Who um, who who um, enjoys good and and you know and calls out evil, right? So. So as far as that goes, I, we are aligned with the Nation of Islam because when they speak about injustice and, you know, and, and those kinds of things. But I would get that. So I would get the final call for that purpose to see what kind of interesting stories they had in there, see what I could find out is going on. And, you know, um, you know, on the on the justice front, what kind of wrongs are being done or whatever. And um but they had a they got a they, they have a statement on the inside of the paper before it starts getting to the stories and it says what the Muslims believe. And so I would stop and read that and that would bring me back to oh no. Nope. That's not me. And what was that? They they've got a um description of it says what the Muslims believe. And I find it really I, I actually find it offensive because they say what the Muslims believe, right? Like this encompasses all Muslims, and it said it says that you know it tells the it, it talks about how um, 
if I if I can remember the story correctly, um, how back in 1930 something, um, a man named W. D. Fard Muhammad. No, uh, I think it was just W. D. Fard. Um, I don't think he. I don't think he had. Yeah, but anyway, this guy was supposed to be, according to what they say, this guy was Allah on earth. And he came strictly to guide the black man to the true religion of Islam. And um, and, and speaking of what, this is the guy who taught the brother Drew Ali. This is the guy that taught him. And then Drew Ali consequently taught um, Elijah Muhammad. But... Um, yeah, so that was, you know, Allah. In per so what's the difference between that and what the Christians believe? So, you know, so that would, you know, that that's where I knew that would bring me back to my senses and say, nope, that's, nope, that's not for you. Now, in the meantime, you know, be, uh, while I'm still trying to <laughs> find my way, right, after I came back to Detroit, and I, I don't know I'm trying to find my way, but I'm trying to find it. You know, I don't I don't know. I, I never thought that I would be where I am now, you know, a, a full-fledged practicing Muslim. But um and maybe I did, I don't know. But um, but I, you know, I would go back to Baptist Church, you know, with my wife. Now this is this is wife number two, if anybody's counting. So by this time I'm I'm married again. So um we would go to church and and I would be there and I would purposely, you know, um, I would pray, but I would pray my own way and I would pray to, you know, to God. And, um, um, you know, I, I, I even had thoughts about going back to, you know, when I would think about how I want to, you know, change my life and do the right thing. And, and I want to, I'm, I'm thinking about my salvation and, how you know? Hey, you gonna die one day, and what's up? Because I, that was always in the, it's always in my mind. Um, but I would find myself about to go back to Christianity. But I would just I always have to remind myself this isn't what you believe. So that being said, I, I did. I, I, there were times when I did think about joining the Nation of Islam, but I, I just knew, um, and it was it was mainly from what I read in the autobiography of Malcolm X, what he said he experienced, and also um, a bigger the bigger part of that came from my time when I was in Saudi Arabia. If I didn't mention when I was in the military, I actually went to Saudi Arabia um, on a uh, on a temporary <laughs> duty during Desert Storm. Desert Shield and Desert Storm. I was in Saudi Arabia at that time. Uh, Tabuk. Yeah. And it was a wonderful experience because this is where I met the brother who gave me my first Quran so that I could actually, you know, see what it said. And um, and that's when I, you know, and I read it and that's when I realized, I read parts of it, you know, and I read things that that just you know um, convinced me in my heart that this is the truth, and um, and so so from then this is the point that I said and I had heard that if you say, um, you know, uh, from your heart that I bear witness that there's no, you know, when you when you say in your heart the shahada bear witness that there's no God. Other than Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his messenger. Then you are a Muslim, and that's it. So now, in my mind, I'm a Muslim. In my heart, I'm a Muslim. You know, so um, that was that was my first exposure to it, or a true exposure. So. Did you take the Shahada in Saudi Arabia, or was this something more internal? It was more internal, yeah, because I didn't know there was a requirement to actually say it aloud to some, you know what I mean, in front of witnesses and things like that. I didn't know that there was a requirement to do that, and, and maybe there isn't. I don't know, but they say that you're supposed to give your Shahada to somebody. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't studied that to say, you know. I've taken Shahada from a few people, and I, you know, just so I can tell them, you're a Muslim. But... um um, yeah, I, I did internally. This is what I believed, and I, you know, and I, and I, and I kept that, and that's what kept me from going 
from going Nation of Islam or from or for going back to um, Christianity because I knew in my heart it's not what I believed. So after Detroit, uh, did you move directly to Anderson? Yeah, it was, <laughs> but not. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, ultimately, yeah, because I, I, I mean, there was some. I stayed in Detroit for oh man. Uh, after I came out of the military in. 92 um i was in detroit all the way until 2006 so what brought you to anderson um <laughs> a lot brought me here but um and i was, i really really do feel this way but um basically i just came down to i came to anderson to house sit for my brother him and his wife were going to were going on a cruise, and I came to house sit for him, and didn't really want to do it, but I came to house sit for him. Um, he, I started getting into into a uh, little bit of trouble again in Detroit, you know, not not the not kids kind of trouble, because now I'm a, a, a grown man, well over, you know, I'm over forty years old, and and I, I just got caught up in some things it was just a kind of a life had become kind of miserable there you know what I mean it was going it was a little depressing um I I had skills but I couldn't get a job you know um it was it was really really at the beginning of the the the, the 2000s early 2000s and you know on through the mid it was it was really 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 di- I was just finding it really difficult to work but um but at the same time, I was doing some things that were preventing me from, you know, from from really making the effort that I should have been making to work. But um, so I was, you know, he, he I think he sensed that I needed to that I needed to get for, away from around there because I was um, I was living with my uncle and um, kind of a uh, in a crazy environment and um he just asked me to come down and house it for him, talk me into it, told me, um, uh, enticed me with all the, you know, the right things. Look, man, you you know, all you gotta do is come down here. We're gonna be gone for two weeks. I got a car for you, I got, you know, um, I got money for you, there's plenty of food here. Um uh I'll leave you some beer in the refrigerator, you know, all the enticements. So, um, uh, I said okay, and and I paid for your ticket to get down here. All right, so I got on the Greyhound and came down. That was two thousand six. And how did you meet any? How did you meet Muslims while you were here in Anderson? Um. Yeah, that was uh. That started all as difficult to, um, especially in Anderson, to find any Muslims. Um, uh, like I said, the, you know, I knew some, I, I knew brothers that were, you know, more Science Temple or nobody from Nation of Islam. But I, you know, my good friend, he's he's actually my barber, and he's the more Science Temple brother I was telling you about. But um, he was always positive, and he always respected, you know, my, uh, you know, I, what I, my understanding of what Islam is, and that we were in disagreement and this and that. But he's still a good friend, and um, so I knew him. Um, he would introduce me to people, you know. I met people through him, but um, really, my turning point where I really, because still, I am still. Now I'm going to my brother's church because he comes back from um, from the cruise and he tells me you can stay as long as you want, and I'm kind of liking it here because it looks like I can work. And within two weeks I had a job, so stay as long as you want. He said, so I stay, and um, so now I'm going to his church, and again those thoughts are coming back. And nope, but I mean I had a pretty firm grip on it. I knew what I wanted to do now. I need to find the Muslim community. I need to find out where the Muslims are. Um, you know, but I really, in all honesty, I wasn't making any 
any serious effort to do it because the thought of um, I didn't know I, I thought I would have to go to Indianapolis, but it just seemed like it just seemed. It, it, it sounds stupid now, but it seems like it was just, it, it's going to be too hard to do this. I don't even know where to start. I don't, you know, and, um, but what happened, I, one day I went to work and um, this, like I said, in my heart, I'm a Muslim and I would tell people I'm a Muslim. And uh, a friend of mine at work uh, introduced me to a guy from Muncie that we work in Delville and he introduced me to this guy. And um, he said, yeah, he's a Muslim. This, this, you know, this is this is my friend Steve. He's a Muslim, you know. And um, and so I met him, and he asked me, did I go to? Okay, do you go to? Do you go to the uh, masjid? And and uh, he asked me, do you go to? The, do you go to the mosque? And I said, where is it? <laughs> and he said, oh, there's one in Muncie. And and I, I went on to tell him, look, I've been looking for one. I I've been. I've been looking, so I would love to go with you. And so he invited me to go, and um, and so I went to the masjid with him. And man, it was just like a, a just a, an awakening, you know. It was like I was, you know, um, I mean, honestly, just born again, right? Um, you know, because then I became, you know, now, now I just want to be a sponge. I just want to know as much as I want to learn as much as I can. Like I, like I felt like I had to make up some lost time, you know, and um, yeah, and then that's when I started meeting the people in this community. And this is the first time that I've actually been in a Muslim community where, you know, I worship with them and, um, you know, learning the religion the whole nine. So, I, I mean, I, I really, I'm, I'm a, I am in my Muslim infancy, in my Islamic infancy, honestly. But um, I came here, I, I, that day that he took me to the, to the masjid, I took, my, um, Amir Shabazz took my shahada. And um, man, it's, it's, I still say it's the, it's the, the uh, greatest thing that ever, <laughs> You know, even outside of, you know, having my children, you know, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It's the most important thing that ever happened to me. When did you so, take your shahada? Uh, that was, it would have been uh, two, uh, 2012. And I don't remember the date. It seemed like I should remember the date. But. You mentioned Amir Shabazz. He's mm -hmm. a very important figure. He was a very important figure in the Muslim community in Muncie. Mm -hmm. Did he influence you in any way to convert to Islam? No, because I didn't meet him until the day that I took the Shahada. So, um, so he wasn't he wasn't an influence to convert, but he was he was very very instrumental in me um, in me wanting to learn more. Um, he, you know, in a little bit of time, I think Amir Shabazz, I, I took my Shahada in, um, like I said, in 2012. I don't remember what month it was, but I remember that it was my it was my first Ramadan when he passed away. And so I only knew him for, um, let's see, we went through that Ramadan, I think, was was probably in like August or something like that. But I remember being around. Amir Shabazz during that winter before. Um, so maybe, maybe I knew him for about a year, possibly. Yeah, the better part of a year. And um, yeah, he was, he was um, very influential. I, I, you know, I respected him. Um, I always felt like he was, um, uh, I always wanted to do good around him, right? I wanted to, I, you know, I wasn't trying to impress him, but I just wasn't, I, I just didn't want to, um, you know, the kind of man, he was a no-nonsense kind of man, but he, I mean, he did, he, he had a good sense of humor. I mean, he would, um, I remember one time we had some, uh, we had some dates, first time I ever had dates. So I went to the masjid this day and they, and they were passing out, you know, dates and, uh, and so I look, uh, I see, never ate a date before, so I'm eating, and I, I go, okay, so I said, brother, how do you eat these things? And he said, and he just, he, he, um, he 
He put one in his mouth and he said, you put it in your mouth and he's just straight face. Hardly ever laughed, right? You put it in your mouth, you chew it, and you start swallowing, and the next thing you know, you eating. <laughs> and um, I said, yeah, but uh, uh, never mind, forget it. And, um, <laughs> and um, yeah, but he was, you know, for me, he was that kind of dude. I mean, I, I just really wanted to, I just never wanted to look, you know, I wanted to always, I wanted his approval, right? Um, and not a, not a, and, and I don't think it was an unhealthy kind of thing. I just, you know, he, he was knowledgeable and I, I just wanted, you know, I wanted to learn from him and I wanted to, um, if he had ever told me, if he had ever told me I was doing something good, it would have made my, you know, it would have, it would have made my day, right? Here I am, a, a 40 something year old man, you know, looking for the approval of, you know, of this dude, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, he, he wasn't much older than me, I don't think. I think he was in his 60s, but maybe he was old enough to be my dad. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, I, I respected him, learned a lot from him, you know. Yeah. He had interesting, when he would give by, he would have very interesting stories. He would, um, I remember him telling stories about um, Islam in its infancy in Muncie, you know, in Indiana. So... Yeah. Do you remember anything? Not, nothing specific. Um, just just remember him talking about people not knowing what a Muslim was when they were, because he would have been in the '60s. He would have been during the during the um, uh, during the civil rights movements and things like that. And they they those brothers came from the Nation of Islam, as I said before. So. Um, um, yeah, he, he has some some interesting stories, although, you know, I can't remember anything specific. Did anything change after your conversion, after your official conversion to Islam? Um, your family, your relationship with your family? Um, no, not really. My family is, um, uh, I, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit. Um, I remember telling my... Uh, I remember uh, hearing from my wife that my sister said uh, she, you know, my uh, my wife mentioned something to her about me. Uh, well, yeah, he's good. He goes to the mosque, or, you know, whatever. And she said, uh, she said, my sister went. Ugh. No, when I was going to church with my brother, she said, "Oh, so he goes to church? I am so glad he's." Um, I'm so glad he off that Muslim stuff, you know, something like that. But I mean, she has never been, she has never said anything um, uh, derogatory, you know, nothing, you know, we still have a good relationship, you know. Um, you know, we still, uh, you know, um, get together, you know, family gets together. They know I go off and pray, you know. Um, they know I'm serious about it now. They know that they know that I understand what I'm doing now, and I'm I'm serious about it. So yeah, my family. I mean, you know, brothers and sisters, they're all fine. I often wonder what my mother would say. Um, I but I think that I think that my mother passed away in '98. I think that um, I think I really think that if I talked, if I had a chance to sit down and talk to my mother about it. Um, I think my mother would have been a Muslim, <laughs> you know, but um, because she's that kind of person, she's open hearted. Uh, my biggest challenge has been adjusting to or making the adjustment with my wife. This is wife number three, if anybody's coming, but um, not three at the same time. I don't have three wives. I can't afford that. But um, she it, it, there was an adjustment for her. Because um, we're out, and I gotta pray, and or we can't go right now because I gotta pray, or there are other things that we can't do right now because I need to stay, you know, I need to stay clean or whatever. And um, um, oh man, I, that that sounded so bad, <laughs> but I need to keep my purity. I'll say, um, and you know, 
um, she had to adjust to that because it was it was sudden. Like I said, I I um I dived in, man. I I started um when I when I started, I remember my friend, the guy I was telling you about from work that took me to the masjid. I remember him telling me, "Yeah, you can start off with you know you can start off with." two prayers a day and work your way up. And I'm like, no, nah, man, I'm doing five. Five's the, re you know, I'm doing five. And I started doing five. And this is not to, this, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not boasting and I hope it doesn't come off that way, but this is just how bad I wanted it, right? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make up time. And, and um, you know, I didn't feel like, you know, they, they say you can burn out, that kind of thing, if you, if you go in too quickly. But I, I don't, uh, in some aspects, yes, but um, in most aspects, I don't think I did. I mean, I, I just went in wholeheartedly. I had to back up a little bit. I had to compromise, you know, with my wife and basically let her know, it, you know, it's okay. We can do everything, you know, for the most part that we used to do. I, I will be the one to make the adjustments. I don't want you, you know, to have to, you know, so I'm, I made it, I mean, because there was a rocky patch there where it was, where she felt like, um, this is not going to work. And, um, she talked to me, she had a long talk with me about it. And I, I felt like her, um, uh, basically what she was telling me is that she's not going to be happy with this and this is going to be a problem for us. And, and I think, you know, from her, from, I, I, I've kind of felt like what she was saying to me is, I need you to stop playing and come back to who you are, right? Come back to the to the to the man I married, you know, more or less. And, but I remember telling her, um, she said just she just said it in such a way that made me feel like um, uh, she thought it was going to change. And I told her, and I remember telling her, it does not matter. I don't care what the consequences are. This is not going to change. So we're either gonna work it out, we're gonna we're gonna make it work, or we're not. But it is not going to change, right? Um, or I'm not gonna stop. I'm not gonna stop doing this, basically. Um, but you know, when it and those were kind of those those discussions were kind of heated. But when we got, you know, Alhamdulillah, and you know. I love her because she has adjusted very well, and 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 um, I made compromises, but my but I didn't compromise anything f that you know that um, that compromises my religion. So in other words, I didn't say, okay, I only do three prayers a day. It was just that it's never going to inconvenience you. I don't care where we are. You know, we can go wherever. We can go wherever you want to go at whatever time you want. Time is never going to be an issue. But when it comes time to pray, I'm going to pray. You know, and it doesn't matter where we are. That does not matter to me where we are. We're, I'm going to pray. And that's how we adjusted. I remember we were at the Colts game and, <laughs> you know, there I was. And we, and we were walking to, um, as we were walking from the game, down to where we were parked at. It's time for Salah. The opportunity came. And so she became my bodyguard, basically. So she watches my back while I while I do my Salah. You know, and it and you know, um, you know, God bless her, man. She she we adjusted, we made it work. She's, you know, we're happy, you know. And, um, it, you know, we made the adjustment. She understands now that this is something that I'm going to do. I understand that that she, that there, that, um, you know, the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, taught us, you know, he, he taught us that there is a time for everything. There's a, um, uh, um, there are people who have, a, your wife has a right over you, and that's her right. Is, is for you to make her happy, give her her time, right? You cannot spend, Muslims don't spend their whole day in worship. We live, right? We, we, we work, we raise families, we go to, you know, we go on picnics, you know what I'm saying? We, but there's a time for everything. So, 
Salah takes about 10 minutes, a 10-minute block of time every time. You, you, we can adjust to that. We can do that, you know. Keep my keep my water bottle with me everywhere so I can do my do wherever I am, right? So, yeah, alhamdulillah, we, you know, we made it work. But, um, yeah, to um, – I've had – Nothing, nothing major from family members. Just you know, just them, just them getting adjusted. Them, um, uh, um, you know, re j just getting adjusted to the new me. You know, um, compared to the to the person that I was. You conveyed <clears throat> that you had a sense of belonging when you first came to the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. When you first came to the Muslim mosque, mm -hmm. to the mosque and Matsi. Uh, how do you uh, think that Muslims in Muncie form a single community out of such a large diversity? Um, you know, I think it, I think it just, to me, coming in at the time that I came in and with the understanding that, um, uh, with the understanding of what we're taught, okay, um, that you that we are brothers and sisters, and we um, and you want for your brother what you want for yourself, and when you take all the, it, it, I think that it, it I think that it, it it works pretty easy actually um, because I mean if you it, if you have in your heart that you that you are trying to you know as a muslim um islam is a way of life okay it's not so it's not it's not like okay i'm living life and then i'm a muslim it's like islam is first right um i mean and this is what you come to understand when you become a muslim so now um so you are you are obligated. You are um, you are ordered. It's a it's it's a it, you are commanded by Allah by you know to to be together to form a community to you know to to be a community of um, uh, you know to be together. Right to to congregate. There's a there's an obligation to to um, to do your prayers in congregation when you're able to, right? Um, um, I remember when I was uh, as a as a Christian. I think and I think most of most Christians there is no, there's nothing to my knowledge, and I, I hate I, I don't like to always compare things to Christianity, but it's what I know, right? There's no there's no um, uh, no obligation or nothing written, nothing that says, and, and I've often said myself that I don't have to go to church. You know, God is in my heart, right? As long as I, as long as I believe in my heart, I don't have to go to church. And that is, that is actually, um, there's some truth to that because there is nothing in the, in the, in the, uh, in the Christian scriptures that tells you, you have to go to church and congre you know, and congregate with the, you know, with the community and things like that. But there is an Islam. Okay. And that's just an example. There is a, there is a, a you, you are obligated. It is defined that you do go to, you are obligated, Juma prayer is an obligation, right? It's not something that you, um, that you can say, well, I don't go to Juma, but um, but I don't really have to, right? If you don't go, you know that you are <laughs> not fulfilling an obligation that is that has been placed upon you. So now, I say that to say that um, that in addition to that, there are other obligations that we have as a community. So it doesn't surprise me. It would surprise me if I if I if the community didn't. You know, wasn't bonded together as it is, right? That would surprise me because, um, you know, with that understanding, and with um, with that understanding, when I came into this community, 
I, I became anxious to meet more people and to become a part of the community because I feel like it's my obligation to do so. So, so would, would that be the greatest strength of this community, its unity? Um, I think so. I mean, I think it, it, it has to start there. You know, it, it has to, that's the foundation. Um, I, I love that it's, um, that it's diverse, right? And it's, um, you know, as far as, uh, um, you know, culturally, um, racially, Nash, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, um, different, you know, people from different countries, from um, even people from the same country, but different um, that may have with different cultures, right? I think that, I, I really think that is the strength of this. I, I think that our differences are our biggest strength, actually. I really do because I, I get energized by, um, um, you know, meeting people like yourself, you know, um, you know, from Bosnia. Macedonia. Okay. I'm sorry. Macedonia. Right. So, and then Bosnia, like, you know, brother, um, you know, Aziz and, and, you know, brothers from Saudi Arabia and, and people from um, Afghanistan and just, you know, it's fantastic to me. I think it's great. I mean, and every time, I mean, I take pride in, in seeing, um, because I have seen um, massages where everybody in that massage is from the same, you know, origin, right? Um, an African-American massage, and, you know, and, it's, and then this one is Pakistani. I go to, a um, there's a Pakistani um masjid that I go to, and it didn't even sound right to call it that, but I mean, that's the predominant um, uh, race of people that are there. So we call it a Pakistani masjid in, in, in Indianapolis that I've gone to several times. Um, and, you know, we identify them that way. Oh, yeah, it's that Pakistani masjid or, you know, whatever. You can't define our masjid like that. The, 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 the one here in Muncie, I mean, every time I, you know, when I think I know where somebody, you know, you think you can look at them and say, okay, this guy, you know, from here, this guy from there, whatever, you you never know. I mean, I, I would have never known, like, for instance, you know, um, the brother that I did, you know, the brother that I know from Bosnia, you know, yourself from Macedonia. There's a guy at in the, um, at the masjid that is, um, you know, as far as his features go, he looks just like me, right? And I, I, I assume this guy was from, you know, because we got some brothers from Africa, from the African countries. Um, you know, Sekou from Guinea, the brother that I was talking about that took me to the masjid for the first time. He's from Nigeria. So I see this brother, and, I'm, uh, and automatically, you know, just as, as human nature, unless you check yourself, you know, really has you do, that brother's from Africa, right? And... Um, but then I would see him with the, you know, with the brothers, um, with Brother Masara and, and um, Brother Abu Ali, and he's speaking fluent, you know, um, Arabic. And so um, I just, you know, asked him one, where are you from? And he hosts Saudi Arabia. And I, I said, really? And um, yeah, and I mean, it was just a, it was a surprise to me that he's from Saudi Arabia. But um, I, I think, man, I, I, I know definitely, I, without a doubt, I think the greatest strength of this community is the diversity, you know, th because they're, you know, like I said, I've been to massages in, in Indianapolis where there is a, you've got a predominantly certain race of people or nationality of people that, that frequent it. And I understand that. I mean, that's a, you know, Allah made us different so that we could learn from one another. And, and you naturally are going to be, you know, inclined to a group that you have m more in common with. But I, I just think it's a, um, I think it's great that, you know, that there are so many different, you know, there's so much diversity in our masjid. Which masjid in particular are you talking about? Um, there is one, it's called Masjid, uh, I want to say Anur, and it's on, um, 
I believe it's on it's 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 out near Lafayette, Lafayette Mall. Um, that's a Pakistani massage. Um, there's one Al Haq is one that I went to, um, and it's um it is predominantly um and I, I say African, but you know, Africa, so many nations there, so you can't really say, you know what I mean? But it it's um most of the people are of African descent that are there. Um, some of the ones in the the first masjid that I ever went to was in Detroit, and that was African American, you know. Um, everybody there, with the exception of maybe one or two people, is African American. So, yeah, not to say that there's anything there's there's nothing like I said there's nothing negative about that because we we are you know that's their community if that's your neighborhood and that's where you know where your neighborhood masjid is fine but i think that there's a there is a definite advantage to um to the diversity that we have that's that's really really um um i, I think you know and, and and sitting here thinking about it now it, it's um you know you, you think about it and and it and and you realize how what a great thing that is. You know what I mean? It can't, I think we, I think we take it for granted. What has been your experience of being in a leadership position at the Islamic Center? Oh, well, um, it's a, it, it's, it's a position that I want and I want it because, um, I want it, because of what it should be for. And it should be for working, doing something for Allah, for Allah's pleasure, right? Because if I wasn't, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have taken it. I really would not have because I don't, um, and even now I don't feel like I, I, um, I don't feel like I've been able to dedicate the time that, um, that I should, you know, um, to the position, and it's because, you know, and, and it's mainly because of work. And I think the distance between home and and the masjid as well. So I, I like, you know, I, I relish the, the opportunity to do that. So, um, and and I say this in all honesty, you know, I, I want to do it for the reward from Allah. I don't, I don't want to, by, by nature, I'm not a leader. You know what I mean? I'm not a leadership kind of guy. I'm not, I'm not that guy that, that wants to, um, that uh, truly even wants to be in a leadership role. But I know I have to, I have to give the best effort that I can. I, I really feel like I, I don't. You know, in, in all honesty, I don't feel like I'm, I'm fulfilling it to the, to as well as I should be. I think I'm fulfilling it as well as I can, but I don't think that I'm doing it as well as I should be. And you're the vice president, correct? Right. You know, BB runs it. <laughs> you know, and, and I and I told her that that basically she understood. I mean, she she you know, bless her heart. She's she said she says, well, we all learn, we'll, we are learning together, but she's got it down. But, um, and I told her, I'm here for you. I'm here for whatever you need me to wear, whatever way I can help. Um, you know, I, I, I follow her lead, you know, she's, uh, uh, you know, very strong lady. Um, and, and she does, she does some amazing things. And I just, I, I don't have the, I don't have her creativity. I don't have her, you know, leadership ability. You know what I mean? Um, she's, I, I follow her lead, and I hope I can, you know, I hope I learn from her, right? I do, I do aspire to learn from her. Um, yeah, I like I said, I I want the role because it gives. If I could find any any opportunity that I can find to to um, work um, for the community. I want it, but I don't want it for me. I mean, I do want it for me because I want it for that reward from Allah because this is what we should be doing, which goes back to what, what you know, your, your earlier question about the, you know, about the, um, the community 
coming together. It's our obligation. You know, we don't get to just, you know, to to sit back and, and just do our five prayers a day and, um, you know, fast in Ramadan. Those are our, our, our you know, those are those are our basic obligations, but we got bigger, bigger obligations, man. You know, as as you know, they. I mean, and they, and they are more. They have they have less to do with um, um, rituals than they do with action in the community, right? Um, action, uh, the way we the way we deal with people, the way we um, uh, the way we react and take action to certain things that are going on. We are obligated to not uh, sit back and watch an injustice happen to somebody, right? We're obligated to not sit back and watch somebody be hungry, right? We we should be doing some kind of work. We should find whatever our whatever it may be, because it could be, you know, it, it you know, it, it doesn't have to be something huge, and it doesn't have to be something that actually where you can actually see a change because it's all it's about your effort, right? And doing it for the sake of Allah, right? So, yeah. Uh, you've uh, given multiple hutbas at the masjid. So, uh, what do you try to convey? Um, just. You know, I always, I always hope that it's something that, um, you know, hutbas are reminders, right? So I don't, so there's no pressure to, um, I, I don't feel the pressure to, uh, to bring anything necessarily new, right? Um, that somebody doesn't, that that we don't already know. Although there are always, there are always going to be people who you may, you know, your chutzpah may bring something that, that somebody otherwise didn't know, right? You may be teaching somebody something that they didn't know. That's why it's such a great responsibility, and you got to be really careful to make sure that you are, that the information that you're giving is accurate, right? And that you do have evidence for it. But um, what I, I mean, there, as, as I said, they're just reminders. I just try to, I just want somebody to um, to either learn something new about the religion that they feel like uh, like they can that that they feel motivated to go out and implement into their lives, or to remind somebody to continue, or somebody who may have you know fallen off and stopped doing a certain thing or whatever. To remind somebody to, to to implement something into their lives, so it's I, I want to I, I want ultimately I want somebody to I want I want somebody to be moved to implement something that I said into their lives. Uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings around the term jihad. Mm. What does this word mean to you? Um, jihad is, it's used several times. It, it's, it's actually only used, and I was, I was, this was brought to my attention. It's only used, I think, about three times in the Quran. Um, but jihad is, is struggling or fighting in the cause of Allah. Okay. Now, what it could mean, though, is um, there the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the greater jihad is the jihad of um, of fighting against your fighting your desires. Um, so the greater jihad is the one that's within what you um, what you have to fight against. Um, for instance. Um, I don't know whatever whatever sin you might be prone to, you have to fight or fighting for fighting with your your inner self with the whisperings of you know the whisperings for your inner self to not be prideful to not be arrogant to uh, to not show off to not, you know to 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 make everything that you do um, you know for Allah's cause. Now the lesser jihad is the is d does actually refer to war. 
Um, but that's about fighting for um, for fighting against oppression because there's nothing that says Allah tells us that we don't. We are allowed to defend ourselves. Okay, it's not. It's not jihad. Is not about aggression. Jihad is about defend about self defense. Okay, and that could mean that could be war, right? Um, but also, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us how even he taught us everything. He taught us even how to how to fight a war, right? Um, uh, so, for instance, um, remember he said that you know when the when the 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 uh, battle with better was about to take place he forbid he forbade the um the muslim from even cutting a tree you know during the battle you can't even cut a tree down no you know n uh you can't harm an, a woman a child or an elderly person you know it's about war against combatants other combatants war is a reality of life um Jihad, the way that that uh, that it has been misused, and um, and then therefore uh, misunderstood, is, I mean, there was never it was ne never we were never uh, you were never justified in randomly killing innocent people. It's it's war, but it is war in the in the most if I can say this, the more pure sense, you know, the purest sense of war. You are fighting against another army. That's jihad. That's the lesser jihad. And I hope that answers your question on that. <laughs> I, I don't, I, and I, I just want to also say, I don't, I, um, I don't want to feel like, uh, and I don't want to sound like that I'm trying to defend, um, uh, Anything that that anybody I'm, I want to clarify, but I don't want to defend anything that that um, that someone else might have, you know, that that the the uh, misconception that somebody else has put out there, you know, not trying to defend anything like that. I I just really want you know people to understand what it actually means. It is war. It is, but it could be war with your. It could be a struggle. So it's a struggle with yourself or struggle against somebody who's oppressing you. And that's what it comes down to. Besides Amir Shabazz, are there any other features of Islam that have been important guides to you? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, it. quite a few people in, the, in our masjid. Um, Dr. Barami. He's, uh, he's, he, you know, I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like he's my, you know, he's my mentor. He, he always, he, he tries to encourage me to, um, to be more, um, I think, I, I kind of feel like he, he encourages me, he wants me to be like a, uh, uh, a public speaker, basically, right? He's, um, he, he kind of, I, I look at him as kind of a mentor, you know. Um, um, let's see, I, I always like to, to listen to some of the brothers, you know, who are here, um, you know, uh, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, as I said, I learned about, um, uh so when you say teach, you know, that you learn from, I mean, any little thing, you know what I'm saying? Knowledge, I've, I've learned to, um, to, uh, to, um, to cherish knowledge no matter how small it is because, you know, any little thing could answer a, a, a big question for you that you don't even know is a big question. So, for instance, I um, found out from, uh, from talking to Rashid and, and Brother Abdul Rahman about um, Muhammad Ali, right? Because I didn't know that he had ever, I didn't, I, 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 I always wondered in my mind what, what happened to, was he from the nation, was he still with the Nation of Islam? Because, and the reason I asked that is because they were, uh, is because Muslims were talking so, I mean, and no doubt he was a, you know, he is a very, very good man. Um, 
But they were talking the way they were talking about him after he passed away, talking about his his janaza and talking about, you know, and they talked about him like he was a Muslim, right? I wouldn't expect that. I wouldn't expect that same um that's the for them to speak the same way about let's say Louis Farrakhan, okay? Um because you know, as far as, you know, from a theological standpoint, Louis Farrakhan is on Kufra, right? Um, so I'm hearing this and I say, okay, so now when, uh, okay, so Muhammad Ali is recognized as a Muslim. How did that happen? When did he, was he still with the Nation of Islam? And I actually had to ask, you know, um, and, and I don't know why it came to me to ask Rashid and, and, um, and and they sat down and, and explained to me about the uh you know the nineteen after Elijah Muhammad died, what happened when the nation of Islam as a you know, for the most part, um were told by Elijah Muhammad's son who who oddly enough, Elijah Muhammad with the what even even as he was teaching the the you know the nation of Islam over here he actually sent his son to Medina and Mecca to learn and so his son learned Islam right from you know and became from scholars you know you're not going to go over there and learn about nation of Islam you go over there talking about nation of Islam you know <laughs> You you gonna at the very least you gonna be your butt gonna be sent back to America. Get out of here with that, right? Um, but uh, so he went to school there and he learned Islam there. So when he came back after Elijah Muhammad died, he had uh, they had a big video conference. I guess back in I don't know what it was, maybe closed circuit TV or whatever. But they got all the Muslims together, all the nation of Islam together, and that's when and um, Wallace. Wallace Dean Muhammad told them that we are going to start practicing Islam. What we were doing was not Islam. We are going to start practicing Orthodox Islam. And he had them all stand there and take the Shahada. And they started over. And so I asked, well, what happened to Farrakhan? Why are they still on that? And they said, um, basically what amounts to Farrakhan stayed it, keeps perpetuating the nation of Islam because of the because of the financial gain he gets from it. Um and, you know, I believe that because I, I believe that he knows that it's not the truth. He knows that it isn't. I mean he's gotta know, right? Um I, I don't know. Allahu alam. <laughs> but I, I I um yeah uh, so I say that to say um, Brother Rashid, Brother Abdul Rahman, good teachers because they 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 you know tell you about some of the you know the history of Islam and and help you get a better understanding. Um, Doctor Barami helps me with my khutbah. He helps me understand. Brother uh, Yasin is a, a is a very knowledgeable brother that I uh, learned from. I don't know if you know Brother Yasin. He was he doesn't. Um, he he doesn't come to the masjid as often as he used to. He's another. He's a brother from Anderson. Um, uh, you know, just it, bits and pieces. Young brothers like Brother Masaira, who's who's um, who's uh, who's teaching me Arabic, and um, you know, just willing to answer any question that you may have. You know, so there are quite a few. I would like uh, to uh, shift our focus towards America and the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I would like to ask you a question about, as an African African American Muslim, what is your sense of the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, it's about writing an injustice. So I feel very, I feel very, very strongly about it. I mean, um, uh, I think it's a movement that we as Muslims should should get behind, um, and I think that we are behind it. 
Um, as I said, we stand with any anybody who stands up against injustice. Um, yeah, I think it's a very important movement. Um, and I think that uh, um, that people people have taken it out of context. And uh, when they say, for instance, that, well, wait a minute, all lives matter. Well, yeah, but I mean, but don't, don't, I, and I think sometimes people purposely, purposely um, act naive because of whatever their agenda may be. Nobody's naive enough to, to, it shouldn't be naive enough to think that when we say black lives matter, that we're not saying that all lives matter. But there's a sense that you get um, because of, um, and you know, with 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 recent events and the way that that um, that um, law enforcement deals with um, deals with black men in the community, that they don't feel that a black life is important. Doesn't matter, you know. So that's what that's what that's about it's not at all to say that that no other lives matter so it's like um i heard a, a brother make an analogy about it it said um uh, and he was talking about the very thing that i'm talking about people who purposely want to spin it to something else so it's like it's like he gave the analogy it's like uh your house is on fire right and you say uh put out my fire and they say, well, wait a minute. What about all these other houses that can catch fire? What about all these other houses around it that could catch fire? In the meantime, your house is burning, right? So, yeah, everybody else. So, it, yeah, everybody. Sure, they matter. But you can't, um, you know, it, it's kind of like if one person is being, if, if one person is being persecuted than everybody is right so i mean it makes it open for for it to happen to anybody so um yeah i'm 100 I'm percent behind the black lives matter movement because i understand what it's about and um and it's not to uh um it's not it's not to exclude anybody yeah every every life matters but you know, don't spin it out and take it to me. Oh, so you think no other lives matter? No, you know that everybody knows that's not what it means. Uh, with the election of Donald Trump, we've seen a rise of both nationalism and Islamophobia. Have you experienced any of these consequences? Uh, I have not. Nothing. I, I, I have to be honest. I have not. Re, I have not experienced it directly. I haven't had anybody. I haven't had anyone say anything to me. Um, um, I, you know, honestly, I have not. And if I have, maybe it was so um, insignificant that I don't even remember. You know, um, sometimes people look at you funny, but I, I don't. I'm not ready to, to automatically say they look at me funny, so they hate me. Right, maybe they're just curious, right? Um, so no, I, I have not experienced it personally, no. Uh, responding to ongoing terror attacks, a uh, second generation Pakistani American journalist wrote in 2016, it's hard to have a place as an American in a collective grief when a as a Muslim, you're always seen as a suspect. Does this observation uh, resonate with your own experience? Um, I mean, again, actually, with, without without having experienced anything um, directly, no. But I understand why he would feel that way, right? But see, I'm a um, I'm. Let me. <clears throat> I'll say this. I'm a I'm a um I'm a black man in America, right? <laughs> Obviously. I don't expect to 
Um, I think that to a degree, uh, at least openly, as far as when it comes to dealing with people openly on the streets, I think that that over time we have earned, for whatever reason, we've earned um, the the respect to the point where, at least to the degree that people aren't going to show you open hostility, right? So nobody's going to look at it's. It's going to be it would it would it would shock me for somebody to see me on the street and say, you know, they're going to one of them, you know, whatever Muslims, you know, or whatever, right? It would it would shock me because, um, because I've been here all my life, right? And I think they view me as. They'll call me something else before they call me that, right? And so they're not going to call me that out loud. That's just an understanding that we, that's just the way this country is, right? I can be, I can be an in, you know, and, and I expect that, right, in some cases, right? Um, but not to my face. Um, so I say that to say I can't read, I can't necessarily, um, uh, relate to what that brother says because nobody's showing me any open hostility like that, but I know it exists for them. I know it exists for, there were, there were Sikhs, man, for crying out loud, that were, um, that were attacked, um, you know, like after 9-11, they were, they were, because they thought they were Muslims, right? And these were, these are Sikhs, um, uh, because they wore a turban or whatever, and um, uh, I, I think that that um, I think that people would be quicker to 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 have open displays of um, of hostility and racism towards a different nationality of Muslim than myself. Because I think first and foremost, when people see me, they see you know a, a African American, and as I said. Um, you know, and I'll call it respect, but I think that we've we've uh, that there's a, a degree of respect that that we have here in this country, where um, it, you know, and it, and it hasn't always been there by any by any means. It was you know, it was uh, it was earned, and uh, you know, for for whatever reason, it was earned, and we and so we're not dealt with that in that way for the most part right because you know um i mean law enforcement maybe you know but they can do what they want to do anyway you know in, in a lot of cases right um but just with everyday my everyday dealings with people no i i um i haven't had that but i can relate to and i can imagine what it's like for what it would be like for a pakistani Right, I, I can imagine that. I can so I, so therefore, yeah, I can relate to it. I can, you know, um, uh, I, I, and I would and I would agree. I would agree, but it, it hasn't been my experience. But I could I could see it. I can absolutely see it being his experience. Okay, uh, in closing, mm -hmm. we can take a few moments to think about this. If you could tell one story from your life that captures what it means to to you, to be a Muslim in America, what would it be? Um, the only thing I can say is this about being a Muslim in America. One of, one of the things that stands out to me is when, uh, is that this, this um, perception that um, you, you can't be a Muslim and be an American, a patriotic American. Um, that the you know, I, I think there's a perception out there that 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 the two can't exist. And um, um, I I just think that's um, that is to to be to 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 put it very generally, it's untrue, and it's very easy to be both. Um, Although I will say that um, for us, um, 
the religion comes first, Islam comes first, but there's nothing in our religion that that prevents us from living in harmony with, um, it, you know, with whoever, you know, whatever, anybody that's not, that's not showing uh, aggression towards, um, towards us as Muslims, um, or that stands it or doesn't stand in the way of our, um, of our right to, to worship and to believe what we want to believe. And this is, this is a country that is supposedly built upon that. So you absolutely can. I mean, I served my country. I was in the military. I was in the military for 12 years and I still, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my service. I'm not necessarily proud of the things that I've that I, uh, you know, from a political standpoint, that I just, that, you know, the reasons that we, that our uh, our military has done certain things, the decisions made by our our leadership, but all in all, you can be because I, I because I think that I have the same beliefs as a lot of other patriotic Americans as far as that go. Um, so yeah, you absolutely can. There is no conflict with being a patriotic American. I love my country. Um, and I love my religion. I love Islam and there's no conflict between the two. Um, that's the, the one thing, because you do hear that, that you can't be a, an American and, and a, a, a patriotic American and a Muslim. And I'm, I'm just, I just want to say that that is, that's true. It's very easy. And it's not, it, there's no conflict between the two. Okay. On behalf of the Virginia B-Ball Center Seminar, Muslims and Muncie, I want to thank you, Farid, for sharing your story today. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure.